Good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Corey. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. I got a little injury, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna live. What happened? I got foot pain. I got the worst. It feels it feels like I have needles constantly poking into the ball of my foot, but I'm uh I'm gonna be tough for you guys. How about that? <laughs> we love you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think it's half past two. Well, a minute to go on my watch, so I'll just wait one more minute. Oh, there we go. It's now half past two. Uh, so, South African time. Uh, without further ado, because I know that, um, you know, Corey will woke up early for this. So thank you very much, Corey. We appreciate that. Always. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody who's joined. Um, I see we've got quite a number of people who've joined. Um, others, uh, you know, I'm not sure whether you know this, Corey, we've got guys from Nigeria, from Ghana, and from Kenya, and from the US. So thank you very much, guys. We really, really appreciate it. And we trust that you find value in this webinar. Um, so let me just start by saying that, you know, we work with Corey. He is the managing director of Closed Loop and the author of about six books now uh, when it comes through to, to sales. And there's two more, apparently, from what I hear, that are coming on um, this year. And, more coming, you know, coming fast. More, more coming, yeah. that's good. <laughs> and you know what's good about Corey is that his books are not just books that he writes, they all become bestsellers. So I don't know how he does that. You know, you write a book and they all become like, you know, highly rated and bestsellers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we always find value in reading the books and everybody who reads them, you know, just, you know, gets, um, a lot of benefit from them. And we thought, you know, instead of us to reading the book today, how about we just connect and speak to the man himself? And, you know, on one of the things that we find a lot happening with our clients, Corey, um, that we've been working with, you know, uh, you know, especially now we've been through COVID-19 and the guys are struggling a bit when it comes through to, you know, what we're going to talk about today, of which Shayla is going to talk more about that. But I want to just say to everybody who's joined, guys, if you have any questions, please just raise them up there on, on the Q&A. Um, then I'll make sure that, that Corey gets back and, 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 and gets to answer those questions. And um, I haven't asked him yet, but if the, for some reason we do run out of, out of time and uh, those questions, I'm going to try and get Corey to, ask, to answer them later. And then I'll, I'll forward them um, to you guys later. I'll, I'll buy him a, a beer when I see him next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shayna, over to you. Cool, so good day to everyone. Um, so getting into the webinar straight and foremost. So Corey, this year has been a bit all over the place for many people. And I think a lot of people and companies have had, you know, have been questioning how they can differentiate themselves and keep up with the demanding changes and remain innovative, innovative, sorry. Um, and I've just been reading a book by Ken, Kenpo Sodauji, who's a monk, and he speaks about saying, if our mind is preoccupied with competition, we unwittingly try to imitate others rather than focusing on our own unique skills. And Corey, you're a very scientific and data-driven uh, professional. And I just wanted to find out, do you think this is true in the sales capacity? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the market is gigantic, regardless of what you sell. I mean, there, there might be a couple of things, like if you sell airplanes or space shuttles, there, there might be only a couple of people that can buy from you. But aside from that, gigantic markets out there. And one of the one of my mentors early on told me, he said, you're 100 times more likely to die from suicide than homicide, meaning that you're going to run your own company into the ground before somebody else is going to destroy you or blow you up. Because people and companies are nimble and they're going to be able to maneuver and innovate. And I think that looking at yourself in the mirror and trying to understand well, where are we uniquely positioned to win and where are some opportunities for innovation for us so we can better serve our customers is a much more better approach than worrying about what somebody else is doing because it doesn't matter what they're doing. There's, there's a plenty, the market's plenty large and there's always the opportunity to grow that market by being able to introduce additional product offerings. That's my take on it. Cool. And you find that, you know, often when we when we do come up against like adversities and like hardships in the business world, we try and like go back to previous things that we we know are comfortable. Right. So how how is a as a dynamic in the sales uh, environment, do we make sure that when we're engaging with people, we're engaging with them in the right 
kinds of ways and having meaningful conversations that could lead on to helping our business expand because you know so many people have been doing the same things over and over um, and then we try something and then we get scared about it so we default back to what we know because it's safe but like what is your advice or take on that we can just keep pushing forward to that direction that we want to move to well, I think one of the best ways to push forward is to learn from your losses. And every time you lose a deal, do a diagnostic and understand why specifically did I lose that deal? What was in my control, potentially sales execution, or if you're if you're an executive at the company, potentially how you're packaging, productizing, pricing, or, 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 or something else to that extent. But what's in your control that you can improve next time? There's lots of things that aren't in your control. The market forces aren't in your control. Who ends up in the deal isn't in your control. And if you're a salesperson, how the company chooses to uh, productize and, and price the package, that's, that's probably not in your control either. But isolate the items that you can impact personally and then figure out what can I do better next time. I think every, every time we lose a deal, I go back and, and I'll change at least one, two, maybe even five or six different things and just make incremental improvements. And if you're making incremental improvements every time that you lose, you're gonna lose less. And when you win, the wins are gonna happen faster and the deal sizes are gonna be bigger. That's my experience. And so in your experience then, what would you say are five, five factors or five things that you can actually focus on and make sure that you can keep that, that, that cycle going and building onto it? Yeah, so I think that the biggest thing is where you're spending your time. Mm -hmm. The best salespeople spend almost all of their time on deals that they're going to win. They don't let deals that, that they shouldn't be in linger for, for days and months in their pipeline. And so disqualify those losers fast and then focus all of your time on the, on the deals that you're going to win. So I think that's one. A second one is discovery. Discovery is the, the core of any sales process. Really understanding the pain points that you're solving for the prospects. And, and so one way to incrementally improve in that area is as you identify prospects that you're going to be working with, look at them and say, okay, what market segment are they in? And what are the pain points that we solve in that market segment? That's good, okay. Who's the persona? What pain points do we know that we solve for that persona? And then going into that conversation, you have a pretty clear idea what pain points am I solving in this market segment for these personas? So you know where to focus your discovery because the more narrow we can focus that, the better. The worst thing that you can do is go into a, a discovery conversation and ask open-ended questions. Like, Shana, can you tell me about your process today? How are you guys doing things over there? You're just getting these broad open-ended questions that aren't focused in on, on where you're gonna win. So I think that's two, man, you asked me for five. Okay, <laughs> so let's, let's, let's keep going. Uh, the, I think the third thing is your ability to navigate political resources. So getting the right people involved in the decision. If you're stuck with a middle manager and you don't have access to executives, then next time figure out, well, how can I get access to those executives earlier? What types of questions can I ask the middle managers that they might know the, know the answer to? And only only the executives would. And and figure out a way to, to work your way up that, that power ladder inside of the company. The fourth thing is probably something around creating velocity, making sure that every single conversation, you've got a next step that the prospects agreed to that's on the calendar and they're showing up for. And if they're not showing up for them, then go back and review what you're, what you're doing on that front. And then let's, let's just go with a wild card for, for number five. Just examine, examine your deals, examine your CRM, look at what you've, you've written down listen to your calls and identify what's something that you think can move the needle on the, the deal or the types of deals that, that you're working where you can get incrementally better the next time. And then you're gonna be a better position to win. And Corey, when we've been engaging with quite a few clients um, in our training um, engagements with them, trying to get hold of the next the second tier of decision makers that sit within their company, it, it proves to be quite tricky. So we have a cold call, we speak to the persona who's actually doing the job, the job to be done. Yep. Um, but then, so they set up a meeting to go and discuss that pain, but trying to leverage that network to get to the higher decision makers is quite tricky. How, how could you, ex um, 
I don't know, just take us through or, or say that we could try hard or, or what is it that we could try to maybe make sure that we can close that gap and it doesn't have to be so hard? Yeah, I think that the key is to really understand the different buyer personas. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're talking to somebody that's a manager or director and you understand what they care about, you understand what their pain points are, that's good. But the key is what's the difference between what those people care about and what somebody else at a different level cares about? And why would that more senior person want to take a conversation with you? And what would they be able to bring to the conversation that somebody in the middle manager level might not be able to? So for example, uh, senior executives work with other leaders of other departments within an organization. So is there something that your product or service does that impacts somebody that works cross-functionally? Or potentially this person reports to a CEO who then has to, has to go to a board and often brings their executive team along with them to board meetings, are there things that are at that level that you might be able to help solve for where the middle managers don't have visibility into it? So the, the idea is to, if, if you don't, and again, the specifics depend on what your business is and who you sell to. If you don't have a very clear idea of what executives inside of your prospects do, what they care about, what their priorities are, what their specific pain points are, how you've worked with them in the past, that's something to figure out and the best way in the world to do that is for your company, somebody at your company, maybe you, maybe somebody, one of your colleagues, to go have conversations with existing customers, to learn how those senior folks that you struggle to get access to, use your product, view your product, get value out of your product. So and what, what problems did they used to have that they don't have anymore now that they're working with you? Go work with those folks who have already bought and experienced this, and that can give you insight into how to start those conversations and how to better position you with executives and even ask them, say, look, you're Shana, you're one of my great customers and, and you're in your senior executive. One of the things that, that we'd love to learn about is if, if you were buying our product again, what are some of the things I could say to you to make you want to, to have a conversation with us and engage? And, and that's, that's a good start. And I mean, you know, when we all in sales and we're hustling and we have these monthly targets and quarterly targets and all of this, right? So immediately off the back of the, the head, when, when we're looking at change, it's a very intimidating thing of trying to shift up things. And also, you know, we want to be bigger, better, the best. It just sounds like extra work. How, how do we make sure that, that having those kind of conversations with people aren't, isn't enough more work that's added on to an AE or an SDR or a BDR who has to have to make their quotas? Yeah, well, I mean that's that's fair. There's 168 hours in a week, <laughs> and that's that's quite a bit. So so maybe take one of those 168 hours and invest it in yourself. It's it's an investment, and if you if you invest intelligently and you do so consistently, you'll see that investment to start to pay off. And you look at how long it takes for people to become doctors or lawyers. They invest in themselves for years. Doctors might go to school for a decade after college. It's investment. And that's that's what's required to get to that next level. So I'm not saying go to med school for ten years. <laughs> go go figure out one hour a week where you can invest in yourself. And I mean, there's there's lots of places to find an hour. You can you can do it. The sure. the commute. If you don't go to your office right now, you just you have time. I mean, that's probably an hour a day for most people. Maybe even more. Yeah. yeah, I was reading an article about, you know, how you maximize your time, even when you're in elevators with people or in every kind of space. It's not about adding on to your time that you currently have, but it's about expanding the current time that you have to make it more fruitful in engagements. And I suppose yeah. that for a networking perspective or just even changing three questions that you could ask on a daily basis to get you back the information that you're looking for. And as you said, then you go back and examine what wasn't working and keep tweaking it. Um, so what, what would you consider as the right path, Corey, in terms of like when we are selling and winning against our competition, like we have the, I know you and, and Hillman have done a, a video on the path to oblivion, like what is the right path in your, like if I was a BDR and I had to pick up and it's kind of different here in South Africa, but if I'm about to pick up and cold call, yeah. And I can hand over, like, what is the right path for us to start following those process steps that could get us to win against our competition and then keep repeating that progress, like process? Yeah, I, I think the key is to understand what are the specific pain points that your company solves 
and, and where are you positioned to win against the competition? So if a prospect has X, Y, and Z pain points, I know that we're in a good position to win, or at least we're in a good position to have a conversation mm -hmm. and then create some velocity coming out of that. And the key is to get the prospect to realize that they have that problem, or if they don't disqualify and move on to somebody else, don't try to convince somebody to have a problem that they don't. But that's, that's really the, the key with discovery. And that can start with a BDRSD or at the top of the funnel and then, and then continue throughout the sales process. And if you don't know what problems your company solves, then you got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not good. So you should call Spoo and Shane and have them help you with that. But there are uh, the uh, Band-Aid solution for that is obviously to go look at your existing customer stories and figure out what problems did you solve for them and then go find more people that look like the customers that you have same size company, same industry, same types of job titles, and then and then use that as a uh, lookalike algorithm, if you will, where you say, okay, well, we've got five customers that look just like this. Let's go find other companies that look like that. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, Corey, I think whilst on that, um, I've got a question because some of the, the, the clients that, that we deal with are, are startups. And you know, it's, when, when these guys go, go into business, they've got this idea that they're going to come through and disrupt the market and, and crush everybody else. Yeah. And, and, and then they get the six months down the line, eight months down the line, um, a, a year later, that hasn't happened. Um, only then do they want to move back, to go back and see what they could have done with regard to um, you know, competitors. And then they realize actually they, they're a bit small. How does a small company or, or a startup then get to compete with you know, the big companies out there? Uh, you know, with limited resources that, that they have a, a, as a business. Yeah, you just got to find your your narrow niche where you where you're well positioned to win. So, a lot of times we'll see the smaller companies find that bigger companies might not treat one of their customer segments well. So maybe maybe they're smaller customers, they don't give them good customer service. So that might be a way that you can go win against them. You might find that the if you're a technology company, you might find that the bigger companies have. Uh, legacy technology, some stuff that's old, that's not as not as clean and crisp. The user experience isn't as good, so people don't like to use it. Well, big companies have to have that because they can't go and change every two weeks, every six months, because they have so many customers. So if if you've got if you're coming into a market, there's a, a book by Clayton Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma that was published I don't know 15 20 years ago, and it, it talks about that where smaller companies can come in and chip away at existing markets by finding narrow slices that have been neglected by the incumbents. So if you see that big companies are not doing a good job with a certain type of customer in a certain industry, whatever, figure out what that is and just go get it. I mean, that's, that's how we're building our business. So just, I think it's great because you go out and you're like, you're like, oh wait, so there's 20 companies that do this and no one actually likes any of them. Okay, cool. Well, let's narrow focus in on that and, and start delivering something that is faster, higher quality, what, whatever you want to do. If you want to compete on price, go do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that first because people are often willing to pay more than you think they are. The, uh, yeah, the key is just to, to, to figure out what that is. And the only way that you can, you can do that is by having conversations with people. Mm -hmm. And another thing that he also speaks about is, um, Mr. Clayton Christensen, is uh, about competing against luck. And yeah. Very specific like jobs to be done and understanding what that is for the different personas in, in that market. And once you understand that, that's how you expand. And I mean, that's pretty much the basis of the Corey Bray matrix that you guys built um, that, we, that we work through. And yeah, that helps a lot. And do you, do you want to maybe expand on that a little for us, please, Corey? Yeah. So for the, the, the key is for, for each persona, figure out what their uh, pain points are. And then for each pain point, figure out what feature of your product or service. And if you sell accounting, is actually not, not software, but if you, just accounting services, you still have features. So everybody has features. So when I, say, when I say features, I don't necessarily mean buttons on a screen. So you've got your persona, then figure out what all your pain points are that are relevant to that persona. Mm -hmm. And then uh, identify which features solve those pain points and then develop some content around it. And content doesn't need to be a book. It could be uh, 
sentence. It could be a paragraph, it could be an email, it could be a phone script, it could be a white paper, and it could be a book, whatever it is. And, and identify five secrets of sales coach you see at the top of my screen back there. I mean, that's a book that is identified that frontline sales managers are not coaching effectively and they're struggling to, to get their team to improve performance up to the level that they want. And executive management is frustrated that it's not happening, but they haven't equipped their frontline managers with a framework. So I've identified personas of executive management as well as frontline management. I've identified pain points for each one of those. Features is the coach framework and then the content is the, is the book. So that's just one very high level example. And then obviously you drill down into more granularity if you're getting into a sales process. But the idea is that anything that you do and anything that you solve for should be in between a piece of content that you can use to attract somebody and then thoroughly understanding well, what the heck pain point does this person have and how can I get their attention to, um, to have a discussion about it? Because if it's, if it's a priority for them, then they're going to have a conversation with you. But they need to understand what you do. And that's the mistake a lot of people make is that they can't articulate why someone should talk with them because they're talking about the, the features and functionalities of the product, not the specific acute compelling pain points that they solve for folks. There's a beautiful point that you made in one of your blog posts where you like, if you had to go and have a review of your pipeline, you should be able to give at least three compelling reasons why that deal is sitting in your pipeline currently and why that person can go to their boss and validate why they want to spend X, Y, Z amount with yeah. you. And until you don't have that, then you don't really have your next steps to go forward. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, the key there is you want your prospect to be able to say, I'm going to spend $10,000 on this solution because, and whatever comes after the word because needs to be compelling enough to justify that dollar figure. And so what I'll see in CRM sometimes is salespeople say, uh, Spoo said inefficiency for junior analyst. Like, okay. So Spoo's going to spend $10,000 because of inefficiency for junior analysts. I don't think so. So we've got a problem there. Either we don't understand what the pain point is or Spoo doesn't have one. And that's one of those deals that's just going to sit in the pipeline forever and never go anywhere. So the, the, they're going to spend X dollars because of whatever that whatever needs to be able to justify the spend. Otherwise you don't have a deal yet. You might still be able to get one, but it doesn't exist yet. And I suppose the thing is you can have a real um, killer discovery um, session. And when you hand it over to the next person, like, do we lead? I mean, I, I know I'm going to, I'll get smacked over the fingers when I say this, but I'm putting it out here for the, for the webinar today. But when we're having a demonstration, do we lead with the product, Corey? <laughs> well, the, the whole point of a product demonstration is to close the gap between what the prospect's pain points are and what your solution does. So you say, look, hey, you told me they got this problem. Here's how we solve it. Do you believe me? And that's that's all it is. The, the demonstration helps overcome skepticism and skepticism exists in people because they bought things in the past that didn't work. They've been oversold and they might not know who you are. So if, if you are a, a, I don't know, brand, a, John Deere, you know that John Deere tractors are going to cut the grass. Yep. No concern, right? But if your company doesn't have a big brand name, then people don't necessarily believe that you're going to be able to do everything that your website says that you're going to do. And that's where demonstration comes into play. But the key is you uncover all the different pain points that they have during discovery, and then you show how your product or service solves those pain points, and that's it. Otherwise, you, you see some people out there that, that just click around buttons and they're hoping that the prospect sees something. And they're like, oh, wait, well, so when I click on this button, do you like what you see here? And they're, they're, it's funny because they're just going to tell you they do, probably. Because if they tell you no, see, this is what happens. A prospect sits there and if they start arguing with a salesperson or telling a salesperson they don't like it, they know the salesperson is going to go into objection handling mode and that's probably not what the prospect wants to be doing right now. So they just say nice things. So like any, anytime a prospect starts complimenting your sales skills or complimenting your product, the, the best salespeople get real skeptical. 
like, okay, so you're so excited about this. Why, why is that? Because here's what I'm thinking, third party. It's like, okay, if this person likes the product so much, why the heck haven't they bought it yet? There's still something there. These words are just meant to neutralize the salesperson, <laughs> say nice things. And whenever I'm buying something from a sales or whenever I'm going to demo or whatever with, with the salesperson that I, and I know I'm not going to buy it. I'm pretty direct with them because I respect the sales profession and I don't want to play games with them. But a lot of people aren't. A lot of people are going to go in there and be like, yes, boo, you know what? I, th I think it was good. I really like what I saw today. And uh, what I'd like you to do is send me some more information. Let me follow back with my team. And then I'll shoot you an email in a week or so if we want to move forward. That's that's just the polite way of saying no. Yeah. It's sure. funny how we have that cognitive dissonance towards ourselves in those processes of like, we, because we sales professionals, I'm the same. When I get cold calls, I'll I'll spend some time with the person on the phone just to be friendly, oh, yeah. but to say no politely. But it's just, it's that same thing of like in our own lives, we'll ignore those things. But when we're the like the prospect, we're like, mm -mm, I'm out of here. So it's interesting how we put those blind spots for ourselves. And ultimately, we just want to get the truth, right? Like, yeah, just want to get the truth. That's all that matters. And ask better questions. You're not going to convince a prospect that they have a problem that they don't have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So why would they spend money with you anyway, as you said in another uh, um, conversation you were having? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Corey, how how do you then recommend, and we've also had this with quite a few clients that we've been engaging with, um, how do we get information on our competition? What would you suggest? Because, I mean, you, you've been leading in this and the strategist in this for such a long time. Like, what do you recommend? Well, the the easiest place is the internet because they, they put all kinds of things out there. So if you want to find information on competition, go to their website, look at their social media feeds, check out their press releases. If they do, if they do press releases, they, uh, they probably have videos that show their products or service on YouTube or Vimeo or something like that. So that, that gives you a decent idea. And then talk to your customers. That's the best source. Okay. So you evaluated us in XYZ and ABC Corp. What'd you see? And then that's, that's, probably the the most acute definition of, of what the, what the competition is doing and, and how that differentiates um, mm -hmm. between you so that's it but again I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it too much I think having having a good idea of where you differentiate from somebody else is important mm -hmm. but um, if, if you, you you need to understand specifically why your customers chose you over somebody else and then okay. That's, that's the type of thing that you want to bring up in the conversation. Yeah, because often, often it's about companies, you know, preparing battle cards and going into battle um, against your competition and you're going into objection, handle. Meanwhile, yeah. you know, and you have a great take on this. It's like you go in and have a conversation more than ever and actually acknowledge that um, reactance that you're getting. Yeah, because... The, the objection, the, that's the thing, like an objection is just an invitation to have a conversation. If, if Spoo says your price is too high, I might say, well, Spoo, what, what type of price range were you expecting from us? And then he can start elaborating and we figure out where we're at. And if he says that I was expecting something that was one eighth, then we probably have a problem, but hey, maybe I have an offering that costs one eighth. Maybe there's something else I can do. But the idea is whenever we hear an objection, we need to ask a question. And if we ask a question, we can get some clarity around what's the source of that or what's what's the context? What, why does it really matter? Instead of going and battling it and saying, well, so I don't know, I'd have to disagree based on what I hear from our other customers. Like, you're, you're never gonna change somebody's mind talking like that. No way, no way. And, and, and Corey, you know what, what, what I find as well? Um, <laughs> sometimes the, the leadership and the sales people, the sales team, how they view competition is completely different from each other. Yeah. Um, I, I find that the, the leaders seem to think, of course, these guys are not competition. Um, then when you go through to the sales guys and you, you say, guys, why aren't you winning? They always using them, their competition as an excuse. How do you align the two, uh, you know, from the experience that you've, you've, you've done? Well, so, so what often happens is that the leadership looks and sees that the sales team's not executing as well yeah. as they should be. So I think that things like price and competition are an excuse if everything else is executed well. 
So did you did you tee up the meeting well? Did you get logistics and agendas and next steps covered tight at the top of the meeting? Did you ask some good pain-based discovery questions that are relevant to the prospects, relevant to the persona, relevant to the marketplace? Did you dig in to really understand where's that, we're solving that pain fit on the priority list? Did you do a good job of understanding the other political stakeholders, financial resources, technology environment that, that might exist? And did you do a good job of managing the resistance that came up during the, during the conversation and create velocity into the next, into the next meeting? So did you execute and do all of those things or did you just go in ask a couple open-ended process questions and then lose to the competition? Were you outsold or does the competition really have a superior solution or superior offering? So that's the key. I think that it's, this, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Salespeople need to focus on the things they can control. You can't control what the competition's offering is. You can control how well you execute during cold calls, discovery meetings, demos, and then moving forward through proposals. So that's that's the key. And that's why executives often are somewhat dismissive because they see and they say, look, we're not executing as well as we should be. That's why we're losing. We're not losing because Joe Blow company has a, a different product feature than us. Wow. Okay. And um, we have a question from the the, um, the the chat box here. I see. Um, is it advisable to do a discovery during a cold call, or rather during a cold call, one should push for another call or a meeting for the session for a discovery? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think the key is ask the prospect if they have some more time today, and that's it. Get them to opt into it. If you can okay. if you do it, then it's it's less friction because you don't have to get them to show up to another meeting. So that's that's good. So if, um, sorry, I have this massive, I feel like I've got three needles poking into my foot right oh, now. Oh, sorry, We're, man, sorry. No, it's okay. See, so you, you gotta be tough if you're doing this profession. It's the worst thing <laughs> I've been in for years, but I took some medicine just now, so I should be fine. Um, sure. Okay, so the, uh, the key is uh, eliminate friction to the extent that you can. If you're able to get them to agree to spend some more time with you, that's great. Do it on the call, but create some certainty and ask ask for as much time as you need. So if you need 15 more minutes to ask some questions, just you know, once you go through the opening part of your poll call, suppose, I don't know if you have 15 more minutes today, but maybe we can dig in a little deeper and understand if it makes sense for us to, to look at a demo in the next few days, or we could set up some time to, uh, to do that separately. What do you think? And then if they have time, great. If they don't, then, then schedule another meeting. That's what I do. Says thank you. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, so, so then for the my management answer is, yeah, for people that have sales development reps and business development reps, the uh, the purpose of the SDRs and BDRs is to keep the closers calendars full. So if if your closers calendars are not full, then the SDRs and BDRs should be doing less discovery and just flipping over meetings and spending their time on generating meetings as opposed to doing discovery and qualifying folks. Now, if the closers calendars are really full, that's when you want your SDRs and BDRs to be doing deeper discovery, disqualifying more people and working as a team because the most expensive thing that happens in a sales organization is a closer who doesn't have a full calendar. Yeah, sure, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we've, we've seen it so many times where you know, if 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 closers to just, to just change and have calendar I mean, have meetings in that calendar, so suddenly the, the whole business changes where they want to go. You know, it's it's absolutely amazing um, what that one can do just from having those full meetings. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I suppose and that's one of of the ways in which a business can compete against uh, their competitors. Make sure that your diaries are full. Uh, you know, like you said, Corey, this is what I, I can control. I can't control what the price is or what they're doing. But if my diary is full, I'm giving yeah. myself a, a better chance at, you know, at being the winner when it comes through to winning this, this, this time that we, we have. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Super. Uh, I've got one more question here. Um, is it advisable to specialize in the sales process? Uh, I'm not sure what it means, but uh, like, like pipeline, Generating specialist and closing specialist. I don't know if you get the question. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is because yeah. the for for two different reasons. One is is just focus on the job, and the other one's economical. So the focus on the job is if if somebody's in a prospecting mode and they can just spend all of their time trying to get meetings, then that's not a distract. They're not distracted by other stuff that's set up on their calendar. So they might say, "Oh, I've only got ten minutes to prospect because I got this other scheduled meeting." Mm. So the more the more flexibility they have to find people to prospect and to either conduct their email, phone call, social, whatever outreach to them, that's good. And then from an economics perspective, I don't know how it is everywhere, but in the U.S., the closers are much more expensive than the prospectors. And so the, the idea of paying somebody to a, a lower wage to go do the prospecting makes more economic sense as opposed to paying somebody at a higher wage to do something that you can get somebody to at a junior level. And then the cool thing is that the prospectors build those skills up and then move into the closing role and end up making more money. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, no, I, I think it's the, the same here. And we, we, we've seen that guys that come out from, from college come through as prospectors and then if they do a good job, kill it, Within a few years, they're one of the of the best that a, a, a company would would have. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so another question. So I mean, so I want to prioritize all the questions that, that we're getting from our, our panelists before we can go through to, to our ones. So obviously, um, sure. the the one says, says that you know while doing uh, while doing research on your competition, can you actually request a demo from competitors, or is that unethical? So. Uh, first rule of thumb is if you have to ask, is it unethical? It probably is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the second, the second test is, would you want, would you want somebody to publicly post in your newspaper or on LinkedIn that you are going around and asking for demos from your competition? Wow. Yeah. Would you want somebody doing it to your company that works at the competition? And what the heck are you trying to figure out? I mean, if you're, if you're trying to figure out what they're, if they're so, so assume for, for a second that they're not going to do a demo until they do some discovery. So, are you going to lie? You're going to make some stuff up. And then, when you see the demo, what are you going to do with that information? Mm. Uh, I mean, I think that you know, a lot of companies will post videos of the products online so you can, you can find some stuff. And even, even then, their customers and their partners will do unsanctioned videos that you can go find. So, yeah, 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 I would. <laughs> so I'll uh, I'll tell you why I think somebody's asking this question, Corey. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think we all love sports. Uh, Americans love basketball and and, and football. Uh, in here in SA, we, we like rugby. And I just watched a documentary now, very similar to um, the one done by Michael Jordan uh, on how we won the World Cup. And yeah. you know, when you listen to to, to how they're working in in in, uh, in the um, the playbooks, you know, like, you know, when Japan comes this way, we know this guy's going to move this way, you know. So I think the guys want to apply the same thinking when it comes to, to competitors. We want to know exactly what feature they have on their product. So that when I'm speaking to your prospect and then they raise this part, I know how to rebut with using this part because I've seen from, from that. I think that's where the mindset comes from, where we want to know exactly how everybody else is, is is behaving in their own product as compared to how we're behaving in our own one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's fair. I think that first there's, there's a lot of assumptions there. So the first assumption would be that if you go meet with one salesperson in their company, that they're going to represent what everybody else is doing. Probably not. They're probably doing something yeah. a little differently. So to actually do that, you have to go get a bunch of demos from a bunch of different salespeople. Yeah. And, and the second thing is, why is that, why does that really matter? And how's that going to impact your ability to, to close mm -hmm. deals? I think that going back to the earlier point of, if you're really worried about your competition, ask your customers, when you went through your evaluation process, what were things you liked about us? What did you dislike? What other competitors did you review? And tell us about your likes and dislikes across, across them. And cause that's what really matters. What really matters is mm -hmm. your customer's perspective, not necessarily what you would pick up by watching a sales demo from somebody that yeah. by the way, it couldn't probably do very good discovery on you because you're probably not one of their target buyers. True. Okay. Yeah. There was one point that you raised earlier, Corey, about price not price should never really be a problem. And Spoo and I were talking about this as well. Like, you know, a lot of especially now because you know the market's really tough and people are having a really tough time. 
But if you if you are getting feedback from clients or prospects that your product is significantly higher, what would you suggest that people, because obviously we know like we don't want to discount and price shouldn't actually become um, a talking point as a, as a throwing you out. Um, what do you suggest that people could do in order like, you know, going head to head with competition, which is sometimes is significantly cheaper, but how do we have that conversation upfront with our prospects just to know where we're steering? Are we moving in the same direction? Do they fit in our target market? Are they part of the, the space that we're at? Like, what do you suggest around that? Well, I think that the key is you need to understand what are their specific pain points they're trying to solve and then see if you can quantify those. So for example, if it's a sales team and they say we need to increase our close rates. Okay, so if you if you increase your close rate by 1%, what impact does that have on revenue? Okay. And I'll tell you, and if, the, if they say it's, I don't know, a million dollars and your product costs $50,000, then yeah. if it, it's hard to say, I'm not going to spend $50,000 to increase my close rate by 3% when you make $3 million off of that. Now, if they say, I don't believe that your product does that, good. Now you've, you've uncovered some resistance and now we can have some conversation around what they're skeptical about when it comes to your product not being able to, to deliver what. Yeah. yeah. Can. But that's, I mean, that's the key. You got to understand what's, what's the root of the, the price conversation because price can be... A, there's a, there's a few different reasons why people would push back on price. So one is that they don't feel like going to their boss and asking for money. Yes. Yeah. Okay. They're not willing to stick their neck out. So they're worried about negatively impacting their status. And they think, okay, well, if I, if Spoo's my boss and I go to Spoo and I say, hey, Spoo, I need some money for this thing. If it doesn't work, I'm going to look bad. And so they're, that's what they're worried about. They're worried about potentially looking bad. So that's, that's one reason. Uh, this, the second reason is that they might only have authority to buy up to a certain point. So if they're a director level or VP and, and they, they can only buy, let's say, up to $10,000, well, if something's $15,000, then, or let's say it's $12,000. So it's, they can buy $10,000, but at $12,000, they have got to go to an executive committee. Mm. Well, at that point, I'd probably just discount and let them just swipe their credit card or write a PO for, for $10,000 so they don't have to go get a bunch of other people involved that can say no. So in that case it might be a good idea to discount, but you've got to, you got to really understand what are the, the dynamics at play. Or if you discount, what can you trade? Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're, if you're a software company, you have three different versions. Can you take them down a lower to a lower version? If you're mm -hmm. a consulting service, can you reduce the scope of your engagement? The, that's, that's the idea of if you're going to reduce the price, then, then what is the prospect going to give up in return? And maybe what they're going to give up is something like a testimonial or work with you on a case study or a white paper, something that can help you a value. So the key is whenever we're discounting, we want to trade and we don't want to discount against ourselves. So don't even, don't even preemptively bring that up. I hate it when salespeople say stuff like, uh, this is just the list price <laughs> or what's the other thing they say? They say, uh, oh, I'm flexible or end of year is yeah, coming up. Yeah, yeah. All the prospect here is, is oh, I'm going to be able to get a big discount. Because if you say the year, end of year is coming up and I might be able to get my boss to go down 20%, prospect's like, okay, so I can probably get 40. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, those, those are some thoughts on, on pricing. Thank you. Okay. And, and Cora, do you think um, uh, companies segmenting their the, the clients in verticals works? You know, does it give more results? Uh, does it make more experts in terms of being uh, win for, for one subject? Or should we just go at a blanket attack? Yeah, it can work really well. If, if you've got certain salespeople that have expertise around the types of problems that different markets have. So for example, if you sell in the healthcare, yeah. maybe, it, maybe a salesperson knows what types of pain points and what types of questions they can leverage in order to get into to deals. Whereas somebody else might know manufacturing, somebody else might know finance. So that, that really can help. But again, it's not about knowing the product. It's about knowing the job to be done of the, of the prospect mm. and about how to navigate their pain points and, and have really good peer-to-peer uh, -peer business conversations. Mm. Um, and I think that's a, a very, very point that you, you, you're hitting on. Um, I was having a conversation earlier today with the prospect and you know they were they were telling me that some of of, of the hires that they've, they've done um, have to do with 
expert in, in in a subject, you know. So like somebody who's a healthcare s s subject, um, in meta, and 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 one maybe in in tourism, one in hospitality, and that's yeah. why they hired them. And and now the it's now how do you turn those guys you've hired as experts in the subject to become salespeople, uh, so that they uh, you know yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So that's so that's that's I think that's a different topic. So that that goes to my my saying, which is. If you're going to sue a pharmaceutical company, who are you going to hire to, to represent you? Are you going to hire a scientist and teach them the law? Or are you going to hire a lawyer and teach them science? Okay. Yeah. Probably going to hire a lawyer, right? Lawyer, of course, yeah. Well, so the analogy is here you're going to hire. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hiring somebody, it, it, look, it works. People do it. It's fine. But if you're hiring somebody that just knows the market and you're trying to teach them to become a salesperson, there's a lot of risk associated with that mm. because that's the same thing as hiring a scientist and trying to teach him the law so they can go file a lawsuit mm. against the company. So that's, uh, yeah, it, it can work. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of training, a lot of coaching. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Back to you, Shay. Um, yeah, I, I've covered everything that I wanted to find out today. Like, I'm really interested. I love the phrase that you said, your closers need full calendars. And if they don't have full calendars, well, you got to like sit down and check out where those gaps are because yep. if they're not closing, your business isn't growing. Um, as we end off today, Corey, like what would your one piece of advice, like a pearl of wisdom or just a piece of advice because you have so much, um, just to say as a, as a beginning point, like how you can go and win and sell against your competition. Like one thing, I know you gave me five points earlier and we've gone through yeah. the journey. What would it be? I, I think the number one thing is go examine the customers that you've already won and figure out why you won against competitors. And this could be specific competitors if you're in a, a smaller smaller space where there's only a handful of companies that, that compete against you, or it could be categories of competitors if there's a lot of competitors in the space, figure out how to put them in different buckets and, and then show how you can be against them. Yeah. And I suppose it feeds back to re remember focusing on your unique skills, find your niche. And as you said, there's lots of fish in the ocean. So go fishing, you know, you can find them. Yeah, totally. Stay focused. Yeah. There's a lot, lots of prospects out there for everybody. Yeah. So my takeaway um, from today, Corey, is, is that I think what you're saying is that sometimes companies are obsessed with knowing what is being done by their competitors. Mm -hmm. But if they can just spend time on doing things very well within their own house, within their own companies, actually that's going to give them the competitive edge that they think that, that, that they need out there to win against the, the, you know, the competitors. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. Super. Yeah. All right, Corey, thank you very much. Um, we're supposed to finish uh, at half past, but I mean, we'll let it go 10 minutes earlier so you can go and nest your foot. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for waking up firstly early and Yay. secondly for joining us when um, you're in pain. We truly appreciate that. Um, and, and to everybody who's on the webinar today, thank you very much for joining through, guys. We really appreciate it. Uh, that's why we do this, and we hope that you guys find value in, in these webinars. And obviously, some people would want to know more about what we do or what Corey does more. Um, all the books that you, you've got that he's got um, on, um, on the back there, we have those, book, yeah? those books here, so we, we're able to, to share those with you guys. And, you know, we do have stuff that we can do to help and train you guys, uncover more what Corey has said, but I'll share that um, with you guys. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you. Great. Thanks, James. Thanks, Boo. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Cheers. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.